SRP program, which is Student Refugee Program, started in the 1980s. And ever since, we've sponsored 48 students from 12 countries. Um, some of the countries are including Mozambique, um, Rwanda. Those are two, so Syria is a big one as well. Um, there's Jordan as well too. It's a student levy um, run program. The uh, WISC executive uh, runs a local committee and that's done on um, fundraising. But the student refugee program is funded through a student levy. Applicants actually come through the headquarters. We don't do any of the selection process. The students that come in have to write exams and there's a formal process. WESC Ottawa decides who goes to which university based upon what each university can offer. We could make preferences, but we could not select any, um, like we could not say, uh, I want to go to Laurier or I want to go to the University of, Tr uh, of Toronto or uh, I want to go to this university, no. But you could make some preferences saying like, okay, I have family members there, but you, but maybe we couldn't be accepted to that. It took like, almost a year or over a year you know like uh, the process from from the from doing the test till that one um so yeah but, but but it depends you know it depends from the country like i know some people uh in in east africa especially in kenya or uh, the other country malawi you know uh, it takes like two years this this was a hope for many people you know it, it it was a way to get out the miserable life the, that we were living uh the thing is we did not leave our countries for like looking for a better life you know but the main problem the the main factor was um for security reasons and then when we left our countries for security reasons then we ended up in a situation where we cannot access to our basic rights. Like, I was in Jordan, I could not go to a Jordanian university. I, in any way, because I, I was a refugee, and then, um, and I was from, from Africa, you know, so that, that was difficult. And I, and I went to Jordan illegally. So I didn't go to Jordan legally, you know, that could, at uh, the, the problem. Currently, what we see, of course, is that the Syrian conflict um, contributing the current refugee crisis uh, the, um, to, to a large degree because over four and a half million people displaced as a result of the Syrian crisis. And then you have the second wave um, coming from uh, North and Central Africa through Mediterranean and Italy, Portugal, but mainly Spain, Italy, uh, moving up to um, up to Europe. So there's nothing um, you know unusual about people running away from uh, warlike situations. The situation in camps normally they are miserable. Uh, people are not allowed to move or to get out of the camp. You can't you can't go without getting a permission from the uh, from whoever controlling the camp uh, the other thing is the life condition the life condition is a very difficult in camps there are not good services in for health whether whether even for education whether it is socializing with other people um, like uh, living in Jordan for me was I I, I, I got contact, I mean, I got in touch with um, foreigners, with uh, Sudanese people, with Somali people, with Syrians, Jordanians, many people, you know. So th th there's not that kind of stuff. It's only one, one community in that camp. So 
in various ways, whether it is the life standard, whether it is social health, education, it's very poor at that times. I think the last time we had such a huge crisis was after the Second World War. I think, uh, I forget the number, maybe 40 million people were displaced after the Second World War. Um, with the Syrian crisis, um, you have about 4 million displaced externally, more internally, but in terms of uh, leaving the country, I think it, the number is around 4 million. So that's one of the largest. Always there's, there's a, at first there's a bit of reluctance about you know, accepting new people in. Some are worried Europe is opening its doors to potential terrorists. Turkey has 3 million Syrians and the Lebanon has uh, over 1.2 million Syrians, which is 20% of uh, Lebanon are Syrians. So compared to that, the numbers going into um, Europe and coming to North America is minuscule. It's not even you know, uh, unmentionable in the overall scheme of things. I think we need to educate, continue to educate and to say to remind people the contributions that refugees and immigrants make to the society and, and to sort of eradicate that, um, the fear uh, and our also myths about refugees and immigrants. So I think the xenophobia starts with lack of interaction with others, with refugees, the newcomers, and then continues with thinking about them with the preconceived images, the ready-made images from media, from movies and all that kind of stuff. And then gets even bigger with some of the problematic coverage of the media presenting the refugee crisis as a, a terms like invasion, swarming, you know, like in Britain for instance, it's a widely used uh, term is that the Britain is swarmed by refugees. You know, swarming, we use it for insects. The media is focused, um, and I think as an organization, on either the really positive or the really negative stories. And so you tend to get extremes. But it is not irrational to be concerned about ISIS sneaking terrorists in to this country along with the refugees. It is not crazy. It's a legitimate concern. People think of refugees, they might have a certain picture in their mind of, of what a refugee is, and the media enforces that picture. And it could be a positive picture of, of people, you know, who, um, or it could be a negative picture, but it, it loses the complexity. I remember when I was Jordan, I, I used to say the only word that I hate to hear is refugee. And the thing is, it wasn't being emotional or feeling angry but it is it's a word that you got uh, that you got because you fled your country for uh, uh, for uh, security reasons you know for security reasons and then you got that word and then you are given that word because you are different from other people. I don't like to describe it in this way, but it's kind of you are less dignity other people. You know, when you approach something new, you there's a bit of, of concern, of a bit of, you know, I don't know this, I, this is unfamiliar to me, there's a bit of a, um, a fear. Oh, but when you talk about xenophobia, that's intense and irrational fear. And that's, that's something else. Um, it's not natural. And I think so, I think that's manufactured. That is, that's created through manipulation, through propaganda, through people telling you lies in, in some ways, that you know, this group of people poses a danger to you in some way. So I, I think since it is something manufactured, I think t in order to counter it, we have to be vigilant about pointing out the truth, the facts. So when we think about how we actually deal with xenophobia, then uh, the starting point is to bring people into immediate contact with others, to make people actually live together. So what happens in each and every case, when people develop one-to-one -one physical contact, when they actually have a human connection, preconceptions disappear. Then unless, you know, you have a really uncurable prejudices, uh, that in most cases, people's fears, which may lead to xenophobia, disappear. The easiest way to do that would be to embrace uh, someone of, of a different culture uh, and ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't, 
think that they're going to stay different or that they are different. They do things differently. They have different, maybe some different beliefs, but um, there's only one God. He's got different names, but he's up there. And um, that's what matters to, uh, to everybody is that one, one link to peace. We are just normal Canadian citizens. Uh, but sometimes you get the misunderstanding or, you know, or actually misinformation. Any bad experience, if any, we had was always completely washed off or by the, the, the majority of, of good citizens like or good Canadians. Peterborough is a very welcoming community. When the Syrian um, refugee crisis hit, as the only settlement agency in town, we received a lot of calls from the community saying, what are you doing, what, we, what can we do as a community? And outswelling of support. And as we worked, um, what we realized is that we had an advantage, even though we're smaller with fewer services than a large urban center, we had the advantage of being kind of just the right size that it was easy for everybody to work together. Um, and, there, and Peterborough has a strong history of partnerships. And um, that enabled us to kind of quickly form a very kind of holistic kind of plan that involved um, not only community volunteers, but the city, um, community partner agencies, all kind of coming together and, and a small enough size that we were able to do that without fracturing. We arrived uh, January 5th. 2016, almost two years. No challenge for us uh, I th uh, because we have uh, 15 uh, people sponsored us and they were, they were uh, very good uh, people. They helped us uh, a lot for many things. We are of quite a, a variety of uh, persons from psychologists, doctor, dentist, um, organizers, public housing people, carpenters, um, a whole a milieu of uh, persons and um, skills. Every community is unique and has its own challenges, but I think the key thing is not looking at people as a threat, but as people as people, and it's an opportunity. Uh, many smaller communities, for example, need to grow. Canada um, as a country, its population isn't necessarily growing. And, you know, immigrants and refugees bring a lot of skills and experience with them um, to communities. And you know, the smarter communities are looking at that as an investment um, and as a way to grow the future of their community and welcome new people. Refugee is not an option life. It's a life that people are forced to be that. Um, and uh, if they are given chance, any chances, they are not that doesn't mean they're becoming parasite and eating uh, what, are, what other people give, you know. But it's also they're, they're being given this chance and tomorrow at the same time they will give. Studying the history of Canada, you really understand how migrate, uh, immigrants and refugees really contributed to, to creating the Canada that we know it um, today. I mean, imagine a Canada, a society, a Canadian society without Chinese food. <laughs> it's just, and that's just one very superficial example. Right? So I think it's it's intertwined. We can't separate the the Canadian experience from immigration, refugees, um, migrants uh, coming to this country. I think diversity is important to the college trends. Everybody, um, because we learn so much about the world around us. Diversity gives you. The opportunity to meet people and experience things without actually doing it yourself. Maybe you can't go and experience those things, um, but having that diversity and you get amazing things out of it, it's so important in building who we are as a person, who we are as a community, and who we are as Canada. I think that's what, some, one of the great things about Canada is we are so accepting of the diversity, and I think that's something Trent is really good at emulating, and it's something we should continue to grow. I think universities are built on diversity, right? The idea of ideas, there's no monopoly on ideas. We're not in the Middle Ages where there was a canon of readings and you didn't deviate from the canon. We, the modern university is built on diversity of opinion, of thought, and of people. 
And so it's so important for a university like Trent with its smaller numbers and granted, you know, its catchment really is, uh, you know, Ontario and, and, and the wider Canada, but a certain demographic uh, of, of Canadian and so to have an international flavor and flair through WUSC is so important, especially with the SRP, again, the, the Student Refugee Program, we're bringing in students from around the world who are integrating with domestic students, but they are international students and they bring another perspective and that diversity is key, especially to a small university like Trent. Trent University is a collegiate university. It's part of that 800-year-old British tradition of universities of, you know, Oxbridge, Durham, uh, the, the, uh, Harvard, and Princeton. You know, as, and as, as I say these universities, one thinks of privilege and exclusivity and that. And what's wonderful about Trent University is that our college system is one of inclusivity and of diversity and of, well, we give that college experience, that same level of education you can get at Cambridge or Oxford at a public university where anyone is welcome. And so to add on to that with our WUSC students coming in, it's just that much more enlivens and enriches, enriches the, the experience. And again, there, I've talked about diversity, but the co college is supposed to be interdisciplinary. It's all supposed to be intergenerational. You have faculty and students mixing. You have arts and science in that interdisciplinary environment, but it has to be diverse. And bringing WUS students into that environment, again, is this wonderful symbiotic relationship. It makes our domestic students richer, and it gives a whole uh, raft and a whole uh, area of opportunities to our SRP students as well. It's a, it's a really great idea, the collegiate system, and in a small, manageable community. We don't unleash our students, domestic, international, or SRP, into the general population and hope that they will somehow swim from the deep end. We put them into a college which has several hundred students, or a much smaller community where they can feel they can be a part of that community and truly be a part of Trent. As with all international students, they do have to kind of learn how to branch out into the greater Peterborough community. Um, I don't think it's really fair to put the onus on the on the college because they're they've got other things that they they're trying to do, um, but using the the college does they do events all over Peterborough. They, there's colleges that take trips to Toronto. Um, taking advantage of those opportunities that the colleges are offering to them is great for people to get out and not just learn about Peterborough but Canada in general. There are colleges that go to Canada Wonderland at <laughs> at Halloween. Um, it's a really great chance to get out there and and do things and. Uh, that's kind of one way is just putting themselves out there because through the college you're going to meet so many people from all across Canada and you're going to learn so much um, and those people are then going to give you some roots to kind of connect you with where you're living and where you're staying. It's one of the oldest local committees in Canada which is something we should be really proud of. Um, not a lot of local communities last that long or have been around that long. The one thing that we I'm really proud of is that um, we got a lot more community involvement. Um, we kind of became a bigger um, presence on campus. A lot of students, if we were talking to them about, you know, have you heard of WUSC, they'd look at you like, I have no idea what you're talking about, what is this random string of letters? And you kind of explain it and they're like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So um, we started kind of more people started to recognize what it is, um, getting involved with different other organizations on campus, just kind of creating that community sense. Trend is really good about being a community, um, and I think we just need to kind of envelop, envelop <laughs> and kind of grow that community a little bit more. I have to say, working with WUSC, with our students, and with the WUSC uh, refugee, under the refugee program has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. WUSC has so many, the World University Service Canada has so many different programs that it can offer, uh, and it does offer throughout universities in Canada, but at Trent in particular, it is the student refugee program that has really taken off. In many universities, it is domestic students or faculty who are really bringing in students to Canada and giving them an experience, uh, you know, as a permanent resident to, to experience school and higher education. But at Trent, it's so special because it is our international students, predominantly our international students, paying back, giving it forward. They are the ones who really make the, uh, the SRP program sing, and they are the ones that bring it forward and offer uh, this program to, to, to uh, at Trent. And I think it's so special that we have such a high percentage of international students involved in WUSC, and in particular the SRP program.
The actual um, bringing students to Trent, um, WISC Ottawa does an awful lot of that work and they're on the ground, they're actually meeting um, the students that are in the refugee camps. Um, they have a team that, that goes abroad and um, they're really working with that group to make sure that they're going to be eligible to come through the system. Um, WISC refugee students are still vetted through uh, they're vetted through West Ottawa. They're also vetted through um, Canada Immigration. So, you know, they do a lot of background work to make sure that it's going to be a smooth transition. One of the biggest um, challenges on this end is um, when the students will arrive. So, because it's such a, a, a complicated uh, system where they're coming from, we often only get a couple days notice that they're going to arrive. Their flight's coming to Canada and they're going to be here um, next Tuesday. So there's a lot of a scramble at the middle to end of August and um, traditionally the students are on vacation. So there's a lot of uh, scramble and really pulling together, getting a team to go to the airport and um, we always want to have the membership there at the airport. It's really important to um, be there as a group when the student arrives. They're arriving on a plane with many of their other peers that have been chosen to go to other universities. So they're coming as a group, but when they hit Pearson, they're looking for their university team that's going to bring them to their community and help them get settled. So it's really important um, to scramble that up at the last minute and make it happen. From the student's perspective, um, my understanding from over the years is that um, there's such a, a culture shock, um, there's homesickness, there's um, all kinds of emotions that the student will be experiencing from the joy of being able to be in a, a university setting uh, to the guilt of leaving family and other friends uh, behind that didn't get that opportunity. So all those emotions, they're all happening at once. There are great challenges, and thanks to you know West Central Office, they, they, they help us along. But there are a lot of challenges, and I think the biggest challenge is that you're dealing with a student for all intents and purposes is an international student. But in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the university, they're a domestic student. They are a permanent resident. When, you whisk, when a student comes to Canada, they enter as a permanent resident and they start with domestic fees and domestic expectations at a university. But they are an international student. And so that's where Trent International comes in to help with that gray area. We offer those supports and it's been a pleasure to offer those supports to our WISC students over our, our SRP students year after year after year because you know it's the linchpin that helps them with that transition between um, you know life as a permanent resident and being a new Canadian and uh, you know offer, uh, giving them the supports that every international student has at Trent. Where we can come in is we can make sure that they have their health insurance in place and they have their social insurance number. They have the resources that they need to um, start being able to pay attention to their studies. Uh, it's a language barrier. Uh, I don't mean like we don't understand each other at all, no, but speaking English as a second language and living in a country which English is spoken as a first language, people are speaking so fast, that was the most, uh, the, uh, one of the challenges. We do know that sometimes employment is unavailable in Peru, and so that, that is a factor that when they graduate, they might want to move to a bigger city where there's, there is employment opportunities. So it's kind of, it, it rests in the hands of the students and what they decide that they want. Um, and since they come in, they come in as permanent residents, there is no need, like they have no obligation to stay in school. However, if they don't stay, then they're no longer part of the program. But that doesn't mean that they have to go home because now Canada is their home. As so it all means, it depends. Um, but however, we do encourage the students to join WISC and get more involved and maybe go back and help or kind of try to reduce the crisis at least. I, I, I'm thinking about 
first contributing to myself, you know, developing myself, um, trying to get a good job, living a life, you know, ordinary life where other people are living. And uh, at the same time, giving back, you know, I'm helped. Uh, it's not only me, but there are also millions of refugees who need help or millions of people who are suffering and who need help. So my, my goal is also to, to contribute whatever I know to others. It's not only uh, getting a refugee to Canada and then um, helping him to be in education system or to continue his no, but it's also a saving life. Like you are saving a young person who could end up at least in a mental health situation or who could end up in his country and then you know, being part of criminal conflicts or whatever, or or could be recruited or could be killed in every situation. Only bringing 138 students, this is Bosco Ottawa, right? Bringing 138 students into the country isn't doing much. However, what it does create is almost like a butterfly effect, and that's what Bosco Ottawa is trying to get at, is that we help one and that one may go back and then tell four others and so on, and then it's more of an exponential growth, rather. We don't think that we're helping much to, the, in the, to solve the global refugee crisis because the scale that we work at is so small, but we are hoping that it makes a difference at some point. This is not a short-term solution. It's a long-term solution. You're educating this person, and this person can become an influential tomorrow, and he can change at least, if not, if not for the whole world, and not for the whole uh, country, at least for uh, in a community. And uh, ch change starts from one, one person, you know, once you change yourself, you can change those who are around you, and those who are, who are around you can change the, the whole country, and then the whole country can change the global. Uh, I know we, and this is what I always say to my mind, I wish if wars could end, that's the only solution. But we cannot do anything. Um, so the little thing can, can impact positively.